Aloha, this is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. I am welcoming back a friend of the show, Eric Palicki. He, um, this is his third time back on the podcast. He is here to promote his new five-part limited series, Ninja Kaiden from Black Box Comics and Manticore. Um, it is the opening chapter of his um, saga, What Rough Beasts? Um, saga, if I got that correct. Now, Ninja Kaiden issue three will be in shops on September 28th, and issue four will be out on October 26th. And also to Manticore, um, that will be on his website, ericpalicki.com. Eric, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, well, first of all, aloha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. Uh, I hope you're doing well also. Jason, thanks again. Um, I'm really happy to be here. No, Eric, I, I'm going to say just, you know, thank you. Just thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming back. You know, um, you know, listeners, we are in for a treat because, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, like I said, we're going to talk about, you know, um, his, um, Eric's um, new five-part series, Ninja Kaiden. And also um, his um, his um, and Manticore that that was um, that was started off as a Kickstarter last year, and it will soon be available on his website. Um, now, Eric, before we get into questions and everything, I just want to go over a few stuff to let if it's you know if we have new readers or new listeners to the show, I just want to you know tell them what your uh, previous works have been, and please feel free to jump in to add anything. Okay. So, so Eric has written, you know, of course, Atlantis wasn't built for tourists by, by Scout Comics. That's already uh, out in trade paperback. Um, Fake Empire from Darby Pop. He's also written and edited some anthology books, such as two volumes of Dead Beats. That's a musical horror anthology. I have both volumes. I, and I've read through some of the short stories. They're great. Um, also, two another um, anthology book that he's also edited was, and also written some stories for him. I should have said is all we ever wanted: stories of a better world. And these two trades are available through a Wave New World. Is that correct, Eric? It's a Wave Blue World. Wave Blue um, World. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no worries at all. Um, yes. So. And then there was also a second volume, uh, a companion volume to All We Ever Wanted called Maybe Someday, which was a second volume of uh, uh, science fiction that had more of a, an aspirational bent. I see, you know, your your listeners won't be able to see it, but you're wearing a, a, a Star Trek t-shirt. Yes. And we were, my my co-editor, Matt Miner and I, the, the idea for All We Ever Wanted and then Maybe Someday was that we had kind of looked at the the, the science fiction that was popular at the time that we started putting this anthology together and everything was, you know, we were, we were sort of going back towards dystopianism with, with the I Am Legend movie with Will Smith and the new Mad Max. And we wanted to, to kind of lean back into that. What if the future is not awful kind mm -hmm. of uh, science fiction? So that's where, that's where those projects were born. And, you know, uh, um, Matt, always said that all we ever wanted and maybe someday were more Star Trek, less Mad Max, that yes. kind of, that kind of science fiction. Okay. And then also to listeners, um, um, one last um, book that he, he and his sister Adrian work, um, Adrienne worked on is No Angels. And that's from, correct me if I'm wrong, Black Mask Studios, is that correct? Yeah, Black Mask Studios, yes. Okay. All right, now, Eric, did I miss anything or do you wanna add anything else? To, uh, to your list that readers should uh, did we talk about blacksmith from ahoy comics oh was the other. <laughs> i'm sorry i forgot about that that's right that's all right that was the uh that was my other uh you know that was a, a five-part mini series from ahoy comics uh black and white supernatural noir series with just a little humorous edge we just finished that up at the beginning of the year and the trade paperback is now available in stores and uh, it has been previously announced, but Wendell, uh, my collaborator and, and artistic partner, and I will be doing a 
second volume of Blacksmith with Ahoy, hopefully starting at the end of the year uh, or maybe early in 2023. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm going to be looking forward to that. Thank you for letting me know about that. And I, and yeah, I'm sorry about that. I forgot all about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, okay. Now, um, before we start getting to questions, start jumping into to his books, um, I want to talk about basically, so listeners, again, Manticore was a Kickstarter that I backed last year. And I want to thank Eric for his generosity. I mean, um, he sent me um, the Manticore um, because uh, you know, he sent me the Manticore book and, you know, along with some of his trades. And I can't wait to read No Angel. And also, he also sent me some goodies from Seattle. So, you know, Eric, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, you know, for that incredible gift box. Thank you. You're you're, you're more than welcome. And, you know, thank you for your generosity in general and having me on the show. Uh, you know, it was the least I could do was to send you some, uh, some of my work as well as some, mm -hmm. you know, some, some treats from the Seattle area where I, where I live. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And then also to, um, and listeners, you know, um, I also want to give a big shout out and thank you to Eric again. He gave me review copies of the first two issues of Ninja Kaiden. Um, you know, um, yeah, we'll talk more about that series in just a moment. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to just encourage you listeners, um, since Ninja Kaiden is from Black Box Comics, if your LCS does not carry that, please tell your source to please order, you know, this, you know, this limited series. It's very good. And like I said, in a few moments, me and Eric will get into that. Um, so Eric, again, thank you for those review copies. It's like I said, it's very good. I love it. It's great. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah. And then now regarding the Ninja Kaiden series, you know, I did get some information from comic book resources, a uh, resource. The article is titled Eric Pilicki discusses the ghostly actions of Black Box Comics Ninja Kaiden. Now that article was dated May 31st of this year, and it was by, I'm going to try to pronounce the writer's name, uh, Sergio Pereira, I believe that's correct. So if you guys get a chance after this interview, um, listen to this interview, go check out that article as well. It was very, it was really good. Now, Eric, let's get, let's get the start. Um, we're going to jump in. First off, where can listeners follow you on social media? Sure. I am active on Twitter and Instagram at Eric Palicki. Uh, and then I also have a website at ericpalicki.com uh, where I do maintain a web store and you can buy some of my older works uh, as they become available. Just because of the, uh, the logistics of shipping, I generally only have trades available on my website. But if you contact me directly, uh, I can put you in touch with either my publishers or I do have some, some back issues if you need individual issues of No Angel or Ninja Kaidan or... Uh, Atlantis wasn't built for tourists. Okay. All right. And then, all right. So I'm going to start off with Ninja Kaiden. Eric, I'm going to say this. And, you know, I'm saying this is a sleeper hit that comic fans should be reading. They really should be. Um, and I'm going to get into more details because, Eric, you've seen my notes and everything. So I'll go in more details yeah. about that. But I'm going to start off with for the listeners, can you just, uh, what is the series about? Sure. The, uh, the elevator pitch, if you walk up to my table and see the covers, which the, the art on the books is phenomenal, of course, and we'll get into Lucas's contribution to the book in a moment. But uh, if you walk up to my table at a convention and you ask me what it's about, I'm going to tell you, this is a book about ninjas versus ghosts, because that three word sentence will sell the book 80% of the time, because on the the surface level, that is what this book is about. It's, it's, it's ninjas fighting ghosts mm -hmm. for five issues, uh, fight comics, just, you know, frenetic action all the way throughout. That said, if anyone who's familiar with my work knows that I do need to have some sort of character development to kind of anchor my stories. And this is a story about um, a son who inherits his father's company and along with it uh, a few of his father's pet projects including the the kaidan armor which is a suit that allows you to see and interact with ghosts 
um, the mystery of why his father was working on this project and what its ultimate purpose is it kind of forms the backbone of the story. Uh, but it does kind of allow uh, our, our main character, Yuki Snow, to uh, sort of resolve some issues with his father uh, and come to terms with where he came from and, and his own history and his father, who may or may not have been the best uh, guy in general and father specifically. And uh, so I don't want to give too much away to your oh, yeah. listeners as far as that central mystery goes, but uh, there is definitely a very human element to this story that revolves around ninjas literally punching ghosts for at least one entire issue. So <sighs> that's so cool. Okay, now um, how'd you come up with this this awesome idea? So this this project has a very interesting origin in that um, I worked with. Uh, I was actually approached by Black Box with uh, kind of a rough outline of an idea, a vague idea of what the publisher wanted to do. And uh, he wanted to have an action-centric book with a martial arts hero at the center. Uh, his big touchstone was the recent movie uh, Ninja Assassin, which I don't know if you've seen Ninja Assassin, uh, but the, the interesting thing about Ninja Assassin is that the screenplay is written by J. Michael Straczynski of Babylon 5 and Oscar nominated for The Changeling, and he was kind of slumming it, and he did this action movie about, about ninjas in the, in the, uh, the real world, and mm -hmm. the, the publisher really loved this movie and wanted something that kind of maintained a similar tone and tenor to, to that movie, and... I've been reading comics since the er, like the late '80s, early '90s, mm -hmm. when you know Wolverine and Daredevil were fighting ninjas every week. Yeah. So, uh, I know that a book about ninjas is hardly uh, hardly has a, a unique hook to it. So I said, uh, "What if he was? Uh, what if he was a ninja and he fought ghosts? What if there mm -hmm. was this supernatural element to it?" But then to take that another step further, what if we took that supernatural element and flipped the switch and made it a science fictional element, yes. which, uh, so we kind of came up with a sort of science fictional or scientific explanation for what ghosts are, why they exist, yes. how you might be able to see them, and then subsequently how you might be able to interact and even uh, uh, stop them or eliminate them some way. So we kind of folded all of that into the book and, uh, you know, gave uh, our, our main character, Yuki, a, a reason for, uh, for his pursuit of these ghosts and for mm -hmm. his pursuit of the, the central mystery. And mm -hmm. we were off to the race and we were off to the races. Because <clears throat> you mentioned about the science, you know, kind of like a science fiction aspect to this because now, one of the characters, I'm sorry, Eric, I'm kind of sort of literally going off the cuff, so, sort of. Sure. Because one of the characters is Mary Beth Sands. And um, um, in the first issue, I love it where Mary Beth is kind of like, um, you know, she doesn't believe in ghosts and kind of, she doesn't sort of like believe in the, like she quote unquote said, like new agey pseudoscience. Yeah. Um, but I love how you came up with her explaining um, about, you know, like, quote, unquote, you know, our being is full of energy and that energy doesn't go away. I, I, I love because it, it just it felt real. It didn't sound like and and I'm not making fun of Ghostbusters, but it doesn't sound like, you know, how Ghostbusters, well, it's plasma energy is something abstract and you can't, you kind of go with it, but she sounds like it, it's almost like she tries to make it sound very plausible. So I'm just asking, did you do any research into that part or did you, you know, just made it up? Um, I won't say I made it up. It was kind of just a, a creative extension of of concepts that I had heard in the past uh, to sort of fill your readers in 
Uh, Mary Beth is not skeptical about the existence of, or your listeners rather, okay. um, is not skeptical about the existence of ghosts, but she's a skeptical about their consciousness. In her mind, ghosts and the existence of ghosts is just an extension of uh, you know, the law of conservation of energy that, uh -huh. you know, your body is full of electrical signals. And just because your physical body dies, doesn't mean that energy immediately goes away. So uh -huh. in, in her definition, a ghost is just that electromagnetic signature that sticks around for a while after uh -huh. your, your physical body uh, expires. And from there, you know, extrapolating from there, she comes up with, and, and I know I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of your questions and I oh, apologize. That's right, that's but fine. From there, she extrapolates a, a way that if, if that energy is there, it must be something that we can visibly see and measure. Um, and in her mind, uh, she, she discovers that the key to figuring it out is cats. And she watches her cat stare at a wall, a blank wall, uh, which Anyone who's got a cat knows that cats just will fixate on nothing in particular for any amount of time. And so she, from there, you know, uh, reverse engineers a cat's eye and is able to see that electromagnetic wavelength. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of the, the science fictional basis for her ability to see ghosts. What she doesn't immediately understand is that contrary to her theories, these ghosts still do have consciousness and they are mm -hmm. still um, thinking and, and existing. And, mm -hmm. and that, that causes the, the issues um, for, uh, for Yuki and for, for our other characters moving forward, including uh, poor Mary Beth. And I don't, uh, I know this is sounding a lot inside baseball and people should really just read the book because I, hopefully the characters as as they're in the middle of, of punching each other can deliver this information much more interestingly than I can in a podcast but um, but you know it's all there but I feel like the the scientific basis and the science fictional basis doesn't weigh the story down mm -hmm. it just gives me a, a point of reference and allows things to sort of move forward yes. uh, move the story forward and, and gives people a reason to keep going mm-hmm Yes, um, and and the thing is, is like it's and and and, and I love it because it's kind of like because I think it's like almost like in the it's basically she explains it just in the first issue. That's like maybe it's like no more than a page, but well, like I said, it it, it, it I love it because it just made sense. It really did, and I love it how you said you know owner of cats. You know, if you have a cat, you know you can you know the cat and there's two panels where she's like, you know, she talks to Yuki about, she remembers seeing her cat and it shows her cat. She comes into the room and her cat's like looking up at nothing or a wall. <clears throat> now I'm gonna ask you, and please feel free to talk about your cat, Jerry. Does Jerry, the, did Jerry do this? That's oh, Jerry does this. Jerry does this all the time. He'll, you know, he'll stare at uh, an empty space in the corner of, of the apartment and mew and and cry and and we can't figure it out mm -hmm. i assume he's, i assume we've got a ghost you know no big deal oh, yeah. um, um and it's funny you mentioned that because um uh you know uh, you know jerry is is still with us but mm -hmm. uh we lost another cat at the very beginning of the pandemic so um manticore a little bit more so than than ninja kaidan but uh, they're both kind of love letters to to the cats in our lives, and and uh, uh, you know there is that element. Mm -hmm. And uh, issue three, um, uh, issue three and four, actually issue four uh, also has uh, kind of pays off on the uh, the the revelation that this is all based on 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 how cats see the world. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much, yeah, but yeah, if you're a yeah. cat, if you're a cat lover, and I have promised no cats are harmed during this story, uh, you will want to check out issue four. Eric, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about you know the loss of your, you know your cat in the pandemic. I'm sorry about that. Um, 
the off the cuff question, the cat Jerry. that's in issue one, is that Jerry or is that? <laughs> uh that is that is not that's not jerry that was uh i think that might be lucas's cat oh okay <laughs> all right okay i'm gonna say that's a perfect segue so how did you team up with this amazing artist lucas Ma meyer is that correct his last yes. name yes yeah and um i should i should clarify lucas was brought in by the publisher black box uh, Demetrios, uh, the publisher and editor, brought Lucas to me and said, this is the guy I want doing this book. And Lucas is a phenomenal artist. And he's mm -hmm. also, uh, I'm very excited to say, if anyone picked up, uh, I believe it's called Titans United yes. Bloodsport last week. Yes. Uh, that is actually Lucas's DC Big Two debut. Uh, he's now drawing... Uh, he's now illustrating uh, comics for for DC, and that's phenomenal. It's well earned. His his skills. It was only a matter of time. Even mm -hmm. when we were working together, he did complete all five issues of the first arc of Ninja Kaidan. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, he's now got uh, a DC gig, and I'm very excited for him. It's well earned. And for listeners, and I'm going to say, you know, um, Eric, and you can correct me at any time but you know listeners what eric is saying is that he, lucas is an amazing artist i mean um to me he has lucas has this nice combination of it kind of some of the styles remind me a little bit about of mike perkins gabriel hardman and greg lance I, like i said just correct me if i'm wrong on that um and you know there's a scene in I think in issue number two that I really love that um, where um, Lucas has basically the setup is Yuki's in front of his um, I, I want to say like his one of his father's um, secret layers or the keypad there and I love it how um, Yuki you know Lucas draws Yuki where he's trying to figure out his dad's code and what's so cool about it is that Lucas gives that look up and instead of just just, just doing that lookup of, okay, I'm trying to think what my dad's code is. Lucas adds a little action of you know, him putting his fingers on the chin, going, I wonder what it is. You know, it, it, that, was, that was very good. I, I love it. Um, now I'm going to ask, you know, do you want to give a shout out to the rest of the um, creative team on Ninja Kaiden? Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole team just has done a fantastic job, uh, you know, Lucas on uh, the, uh, you know, you know, Lucas is obviously the, the star of the show, and I am absolutely uh, in awe of the work he's done, but the, the rest of the team has done, uh, you know, a phenomenal job uh, with uh, uh, the the whole the whole team you know uh, Desi on letters yes. uh, Michael did the colors and then Demetrios uh, was obviously the editor and he's also the brainchild behind mm -hmm. the, uh, the black box so um, you know I think it, the overall quality of books that black box comics is producing right now is incredible uh, I think as soon as the production can ramp up and they can start putting out more than one book a month. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a force to be reckoned with in the industry. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to ask you, um, because on the first issue of variant cover, you know, um, how did they get legendary Ron friends to do a cover for your first issue? Demetrios met Ron at a convention and, mm -hmm. and he asked, and it is, uh, uh, as a person who grew up reading comics yes. in the 80s and 90s, you know, reading Thor and Thunderstrike and uh -huh. Spider Girl. And this yes. is a guy who, you know, has been a presence in comics for me for most of my, you know, most of the time I read comics. And mm -hmm. it's a phenomenal, like, like, I was astounded when he told me he was able to get a Ron Friends variant for this book. And it definitely is a, you know, checks off a, a bucket list item for me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, he also was able to get uh, Sean Chen for an issue two variant. So that's another uh, artist that I've yeah. been reading since the 90s and, yes. and been in love with the whole time. So just just really exciting and 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 really cool to, to have these these variants and these these mm-hmm. these people who were such a presence in comics when I was reading them, yes. being able to, to do work with us. Mm-hmm. That's great. Okay. Um, the, um, for Ninja Kaiden, a couple more questions before we move on to Manticore. Um, how did you guys come up, how did you and Lucas come up with the design of the um, suits? Or so, I, there's, okay, sorry. No, sorry, I'll you're, totally totally great question the uh the suits were sort of the the original suit was um mostly lucas with some input from myself and demetrios we wanted something that was a suit of armor mm-hmm. but that wasn't uh that was more functional it's it's not meant to be an iron man style exoskeleton mm-hmm. it is it is something that you would wear to protect yourself. So we looked at, you know, historical uh, ninja armors, uh-huh. uh, samurai armor, uh-huh. uh, and and started there, uh-huh. and then uh, you know added some some embellishments to give it a little splash of color. Yes, and um, you know it's mo- it's most it's more about functionality than about. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, like I said, a, like an Iron Man style suit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also got to carry some technology in it. And, you know, we sort of did use that heads up display concept to kind of give a, uh, because this is this is a suit that is allowing Yuki <clears throat> to see things that the naked eye couldn't see. Uh-huh. So we did have to sort of use a little bit of that, that technological idea when it came to the helmet specifically. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I, I love those scenes where it's like he can see the readouts or he can see, you know, what the ghosts that are in front of him. I, I love that. The other thing I love about the suits is that it's, um, um, and it, it, like, um, it looks like, you know, it looks a little, um, not used, but it doesn't look shiny. It look, it, 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 it's look, it, he, he, like I think the first suit that we see in issue one, the opening page, it looks like there's a little scuff mark. It looks like it's a little scuff mark, like it's gone through some test runs and stuff. And that's what I love about it. Just doesn't look shiny. Like you said, it looks very functional. Um, it, yeah, the, you know, like I yeah. said, it looks great. Yeah, the first suit we see uh, from page one, we see Yuki in this 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 the prototype armor. And what I did for that is I gave. Lucas a bunch of images of prototype aircraft. Mm-hmm. So if you see the first stealth fighter, the you know the one that we we know of and mm-hmm. see is black and it's you know it's sleek and it's shiny and it's mm-hmm. ready for combat. But if you look at the history of that airplane and you look at the first prototypes, they're not this you know the sleek black. Mm-hmm. You know, Raven profile that we we've come to know. They're they're just made out of whatever materials available. They're going to have different colors. They're going to have uh, engineering uh, notes written right on the plane. You're going to mm-hmm. be able to see measurements and things. So I kind of wanted to have that feel of a prototype armor that's not mm-hmm. finished. It's not polished. It's not as sleek as the eventual version is going to be. And then in uh, by the end of issue one, we see that. Um, his father uh, yes. mm-hmm. uh, has actually created a, a fully finished suit that mm-hmm. Yuki is able to discover and and puts on, and that's where the the, the final design that you see on the covers comes from. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Um, one last question about Ninja Kaiden before I move on to Manticore. Um, after I know this is a five uh, this is a five issue limited series. Will we see Yuki or any of the, um, some of the characters in any future stories? You know, like, do you have more stories? Uh, I don't know 
what I'm allowed to say here, yeah. um, but I guess it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Yeah. So I will tell you that I, uh, as soon as I get off this podcast with you, I'm going to continue writing issue eight mm -hmm. of Ninja Kaidan. So okay. we are moving forward with uh, a second arc of, of this book. So we'll have right. the first five, yes. which will complete uh, one story that that you that we started with issue one and you know that will uh and then we'll have a new artist uh -huh. uh, moving in and who will work with with me on issues six through ten wow okay Thank so you. and i it's uh -huh. it's kind of early i guess that's the first announcement now that we are doing a volume two i do not know if we're going to continue the numbering sequence and do six through ten or if it'll be oh. volume two one through five but yeah. there is more coming so for those of you that re are reading and faithful readers, uh, the story is far from over. Oh, okay, all right. Eric, thank you very much for telling me about this. Thank you very, and letting our listeners know too, thank you. All right, now we're gonna move to Manticore. Now for our listeners, you know, you know, what is Manticore about? Sure, Manticore is the story of Sheila Cross, a directionless 20 something uh, living in Seattle who discovers one day that she has inherited her grandmother's pet monster. Now, poor Sheila didn't know that monsters existed, mm -hmm. never mind that grandma had one as a pet. So mm -hmm. this kind of throws her into a broader sort of supernatural mystery and a whole world of magic and myth that she had no idea existed. And she must subsequently come to terms with the mystery of, how did grandma die, but also how did grandma live? Yeah. So that's that's the story of of, of Sheila Cross and Manticore. Okay. And then um um let's see. Um and like um I I have to ask I'm, I'll probably start picking on somebody. Actually, I love um Sheila's roommate Marla. <laughs> I really do because Marla like literally kind of doesn't have filters <laughs> and I love it how I think um how I guess you know um she ordered drink to drinks you know like bottles of wine through one of those uh, delivery services and it it's great because I love it how you know you could tell a little bit about Sheila by going you know she, Marla pops open the bottle she starts drinking. Sheila's kind of going, shouldn't we get a glass? Your glasses, <laughs> you know? I just love that. Um, I love Marla. I love writing Marla a lot more than I expected. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that, uh, uh, you know, some bad things happened to Marla in the course of this story. Uh -huh. And uh, I had a couple of my beta readers walked over to the to me with the book open in hand on the page where where marla first put, gets into some trouble and says you can't do this to me this is my favorite character <laughs> <laughs> so um uh there's more there's more of marla to come if we are in fact able to continue the story and i know that we'll get into you know sequels to to manticore uh in a um later in the discussion but there's more marla to come uh, okay. because i just love writing writing her too much to to say goodbye to her just yet okay all right okay um let's see and then the um now now i, I and help me on this on the now correct me if i'm wrong too the manticore now definition is it, it's like a mythical beast that's supposed to have a lion's body with a human head. So is that, so Manticore, is that the lion in the book? Is that correct? So yes. And I know that the Manticore as designed is not what people expect a Manticore to look like. And that's another question that gets answered in a later chapter of the book. Okay. Um, but uh, just for purposes of being a mythical monster, a, a monster that, uh, you know, a giant lion that's cinnamon colored and can talk. 
is I think enough enough of us to understand that it is not uh, just a normal normal monster. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So um, let's see. I um, I'm gonna. So as I mentioned in the introduction, Eric, is that um, that this is the Manticore is the opening chapter of your what rough beast saga is can i ask you may i ask you know like what, what is what is the saga you know what um how did you come up with this saga what inspired you to do this okay so there's a lot to unpack with this question so okay. please bear with me That's listeners it. too and again i hope i'm not too inside baseball and i'm not ruining things for people who should just go read the book but so manticore started life as my pandemic project right my, a lot of publishers were doing a pencils down situation. I still had at the time I was writing Blacksmith for Ahoy because they never had a pencils down. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to keep making comics, even though opportunities to work in comics were not drying up, but a little bit harder to come by during the early days of the pandemic. So my friend Chris Peterson himself, um, a seasoned comic book artist. He did uh, Grindhouse, Doors Open at Midnight for Dark Horse with Alex DeCampi, has, has done several books, mentioned that he was looking for something to do. So we got together, we kind of brainstormed. And what I really wanted to do was something in the sort of European comics yes, album right. vein where it's an oversized hardcover book something that's got a little bit more permanence to it was a self-contained story although i do have a little bit of a stinger at the end of this book that sort of allows people to it does leave it open for more stories and the other uh the other inspirations for this were that one of the things that I did a lot during the pandemic because it was the only excuse I had to leave the house a lot of times was I played a lot of Pokemon Go right so people people I'm sure at this point remember Pokemon Go as this mm -hmm. you know virtual uh you know virtual reality alternate reality game where you can take your phone out and you catch you catch Pokemon living on the streets of of wherever your city or town is and I started to think about like the realities of, of keeping monsters as pets and, you know, is that cruel and unusual or, or what would that really be like? Uh -huh. And then uh, I had, uh, as I said, uh, I, we, we lost a cat at the start of the pandemic. And so I wanted to do a story about a, a girl and her pet cat, just because the cat is, you know, you know, big enough to ride and eats people on occasion doesn't necessarily mean it's not her pet cat. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final inspiration was uh, I had gotten to thinking about uh, uh, my grandfather who passed away 20 years ago now, uh, of, you know, I guess almost 25 years ago uh, and how like we were very close, but maybe it was part of that closeness was because of youth and like, what would he be like mm -hmm. now? You know, how would, how would have things have been if he had lived through the Trump years and, uh, you know, would, would our changing attitudes toward the world have frayed that relationship at all? And so all of that went into a big stew. And then I got Sheila Cross, who is very close with her grandmother yes. only to discover that there are secrets that her grandmother is hiding from her uh -huh. uh, that really changes her attitude towards that relationship. There's pet monsters like in Pokemon, there's uh, a giant cat and all of it came together and I wanted it to be a book of permanence, something that you could put on your coffee table. And it's not like, uh, my first experience with comics was reading an issue of Wolverine that was written by Larry Hama and drawn by Mark Silvestri. And my friend had it on his bedroom floor and it was just torn to pieces, right? It was uh -huh. definitely the sort of thing that got rolled up and stuck in somebody's back pocket before they jumped on their bike. Uh -huh. And um, 
I wanted sort of like, well, I, I treasure that experience and I treasure the sort of disposability of, of comics. I mm -hmm. wanted to create something that was the opposite of that. I wanted a, an object, a thing yes. that was really cool, looks cool on your bookshelf, looks cool on your coffee table, mm -hmm. can sit there forever. And so I did this book as a hardcover and it is a standalone story with a, with a little bit of a stinger at the end that opens up the world for more stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so that's what I did. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I worked with, with Chris for the first time. It was, you know, phenomenal. I think he enjoyed it. Uh, I worked with, uh, DJ Chavez, who was our colorist. Mm -hmm. He yeah. did a phenomenal job. Uh, I had only worked with him on a secondhand basis. He did some coloring for a couple of the stories in those, uh, wave blue world anthologies we talked about at the top of the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, but getting to work with him directly was also a joy. Uh, Matt Kratzer, our our letterer, like yes. Matt designed, like it's kind of an unconventional lettering style that he mm -hmm. did for the book. And he created these cool word balloons for the lion that kind of yes. are, are meant to, uh, or I should say the manticore, right? Uh, he created this this lettering convention and these cool word balloons specific to the manticore that look like a lion's mane. They have a like a border that's meant to kind of give you that that impression. Mm -hmm. So the whole book, as I was saying before we started recording, this is maybe the first time where reality met the vision. And I had this idea for what this book would look like. And then I got the, I opened up the box when the printer sent them over. Mm -hmm. I was a little nervous, but the book is exactly what I pictured it would be. And, um, and here we are. Uh, I know that we've, we've kind of gone far afield of the question, but there was a lot that went into this, uh, this, uh, this milkshake mm -hmm. of that became Manticore, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of ingredients. Yes. No, that's no problem, but it, it, but it, um, because this is, you know, this is, because you, because this is, you know, it shows the, the love you have for this story, you know, um, you know, um, you touched, you, know, you touched upon, you know, um, a number of things, you know, the loss of your grandfather, you know, about 20, 25 years ago, you know, one of your cats during, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, and then, like you said, during the pandemic, you know, you, you, you know, um, you know, you, you know, it's kind of like, in some sense, there was also a loss of, you know, um, like the pencils down was kind of sort of a loss of some parts of work, the loss of almost some type of freedom where you can't really, no, none of us could have gone out of houses, except right. to the store and that's it. Um, but it's, but it's a, but it comes right. but the thing is it comes through through manticore because sheila you could see in the first page how close and it doesn't and it's not a lot of words but you know there's words but there's images where you can it is conveyed clearly that she loved her grandmother you know the letter is you know she gets the letter the letter says if you're reading this you know i'm you know something has happened to me you know um um, and the thing is with the manticore, even though this is some huge ferocious line that literally can eat you and it looks very menacing on the page because I, I, you know, I love Chris's artwork. It's very clean. It's very nice. But man, when you see them to me, when you see the manticore, it's this very threatening line on the page. But yet when he's talking to Sheila, I get this sense of, he kind of plays with her a little bit, but you could see through that um, somehow or another, I always, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I get this feeling that he's going to protect her no matter what, you know? Yes. And you get, Chris was very conscious of that as he drew that. That's not stuff that was in the script. And that is why comics is such a beautiful collaborative medium uh -huh. is he intentionally softens if you look page on page, he intentionally softens the appearance of the manticore. Yes. Uh, you know, page to page, and by the end, you can see that 
um, uh, you can see that there's there's definitely that softening and that like yes this is you know I I belong to you now and mm -hmm. I'm no longer your grandmother so and, yes. you know I'm here to you and there's this this page he just absolutely nails it so I don't want to spoil the punchline of what's yeah. kind of a joke of the story but after he picks his name and Sheila asks are you sure about that mm -hmm. there is this panel of just absolute pride that the manticore has mm -hmm. that I just it cracks me up every time mm -hmm. like do you like it and he's just with his chest puffed up and his chin held high and I, I, it just, it, I die. It's perfect. It's mm -hmm. absolute perfect work that, that Chris did for that. Um, I'm going to start continuing on, Eric. Sorry. Um, no worries. But, um, you have to refresh my memory because I remember we did an interview for the Kickstarter last year, but refresh my memory. How, how many volumes were you looking to do for this song? So I want to do five, five chapters uh -huh. and uh each chapter now that we've sort of opened up this this world of, yes. of mythology and and magic each chapter would sort of focus on a different mythological beast and while sheila and the manticore wouldn't disappear from the story they wouldn't necessarily take center stage uh -huh. in every volume and in fact uh volume two will be called phoenix and it will uh it will actually be marla's story mm -hmm. because uh, again i don't want i don't want to say goodbye oh, to that yeah. character yet um but she's a part of sheila's life and so she's going to become a part of this mystery that sheila now has to unravel about her grandmother and about the world that she finds herself living in yes oh okay all right. Um, I'm kind of jumping ahead to. Um, do you have an idea um, when Phoenix? When are you planning to have Phoenix come out? Do you have an idea? Uh, I uh, will probably run a Kickstarter for Phoenix in 2023. Okay. So, um, it, uh, I want to have Chris involved. Yes. Chris is currently involved in some other uh, some mm -hmm. webtoon yeah. projects and some other projects right now. So I want to wait for Chris's availability yes. uh, or I want to find someone that he and I, since he is really a co-creator of this material mm -hmm. that he and I can agree on as far as mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, a path forward. If, if, if Chris won't be directly involved as the artist, who, who then would we work with? Yes. Okay. So. All right. Um, also, um, now, where can, if listeners are interested, where can they pick up a copy of Manticore? So Manticore was a Kickstarter exclusive book, uh, but I have plenty of copies. I will have them available. Uh, actually, by the time this, this podcast is available, it will be available on my web store at ericpalicki.com. Uh, it's, uh, it's a nice, handsome, oversized hardcover. I am prone to, not to, uh, I also have a number of other projects or other books available on the, the web store, as we were saying at the top of the show. So if anyone wants to pick up something of mine that they missed, mm -hmm. uh, Fake Empire or No Angel or, mm -hmm. or any of the other books, they can, they can grab them there. Okay. All right. And then, sorry, I'm kind of going off the cuff, Eric, before I start wrapping things up. But I, because at, when as soon as you said you wanted the book the manticore book to be like in a european format thank you very much for saying that because when i opened your box and i was going this format looks familiar you know be, because i know dc did um the two batman books um the dark prince charming i believe a few years ago because they were also toying around with the european style that was a european style book too but you know but and um, so, yeah, so I, because I love the design of the book, you know, I love the size of it. And also too, um, and, and I don't know, I, I'm not an artist or a late, you know, I, I just, I'm just a guy who reads comics, but, but reading the story, I just love the layouts. It, you know, I, I, I don't know what it is. It just, it looks very nice. Um, 
yeah, I, you know, but like I said, it, it's a great book. I love the art too. You know, I really do. Well, well thank you so much. Yeah, I, it's, I have been privileged with both of the books we're talking about now, but not only that, but throughout my entire career is I get to work with artists who make me look good, mm -hmm. right? Like whether it's, whether it's Lucas or Chris or Wendell on, on Blacksmith and Atlantis Wasn't Built for Tourists, I have been really, uh, really privileged to work with, with phenomenal artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, get to, I get to write a mediocre story and have them turn it into, have them be rock stars. And I say that that's self-deprecating. Yeah, I'm very proud of my contributions as well. But it definitely helps when you know that you have the, uh, the artists who are going to pick up the slack and mm -hmm. just run with the stories. And, and I love it. Like I said, Chris kind of just created this gradual soft softening of, of the manticore that was perfect for the story, not something I put in the script. And that's where the magic of collaboration happens. Yes. Um, I'm kind of going off the cuff. Let me just try to say this real quickly, but because I think there was one scene in Manticore where there's two panels of the Manticore's face. And I had to look twice where it's like, I mean, it, I thought it was like the same shot, but you could see this sinister grin, but it, it starts softening a little bit in the second panel. I, it's just great. I just love it. So yeah. Okay. Sorry. So um, let me start wrapping this up, Eric. Okay. Now, actually, let me ask you this. Now, um, now this is a fun question, you know, sure. or actually before I get to the fun questions, you know, I flipped through No Angels Trade. I saw the last page. It said end of book one. Eric, I'm sorry. I have to ask this question. When are we going to get a follow-up series for, of No Angel? I would love to do a follow-up uh, series of No Angel. I think Adrienne is on the same page. Uh, it is really, it's in the publisher's hands right now, right? Oh, the, the, ball is in, the ball is in Black Mask's court as to whether we do a second volume. Oh, okay. uh, I think there's definitely a possibility uh, of that happening, especially considering uh, my sister's recent success with the Orville. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so I think that, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely a possibility, but I can't really nail down a date or a time or, um, mm -hmm. or, or give you any definitive answer more than the will is there. We're mm -hmm. just waiting for the publisher to give us the go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. No, but no. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Um, how fun was it going back to conventions this year? It is, um, it has been a fantastic experience. It's good to see my, my friends, to see all of my colleagues, to remember why I really love comic books. Mm -hmm. And it's been phenomenal. I do want to say I came back from C2E2, uh, I wasn't as careful as I should have been with my masking and I came back from C2E2 with COVID. So I am very happy to see that conventions like Emerald City and New York Comic Con are still mandating that uh, mm -hmm. people wear masks at yes. the show. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's it's we we may say that the pandemic is over but the threat of covid is still there and i felt awful for 10 days thankfully i'm i'm on the mend i'm okay mm -hmm. i don't have any of the long term long covid symptoms so you know i'm kind of blessed in that in that regard but while i'm i'm getting serious on a fun question Conventions have been fantastic, Jason. Mm -hmm. I am very happy to, to be back. I'm looking forward to being at New York Comic Con, uh, I, where I will have copies of, of Manticore as well as Ninja Kaidan numbers one and two and possibly three. Mm -hmm. And uh, Atlantis wasn't built for tourists and Blacksmith. So I hope people who are coming to New York Comic Con will come see me at Artist Alley Table G15. Yes, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, 
uh, besides New York Comic Con, any other conventions in for the rest of the year? Uh, that will be my last convention of the year. Okay. Uh, I am hoping uh, with with Emerald City and C2E2 moving back to the spring in 2023, I'm hoping to be at both of those shows. I believe they are in March and April, respectively. Mm -hmm. uh, always a great time. Everyone should come out to Seattle in the spring after we've gotten through our long five month period of, of no sun at all. It'll be mm -hmm. beautiful in the spring mm -hmm. and warming up and mm -hmm. we, can, we can eat wonderful food. All right, any closing words to our listeners? Uh, I just want to thank everyone who's checked out my book so far and thank you very much for, for hosting me now for the third time. It's always a pleasure to talk comics with you, Jason. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the show. I'm a friend of the show and I will come back anytime you'll have me. All right, Eric Gow. Oh, thank you. All right. No, oh, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. You know, Eric, you know, again, you know, mahalo. Thank you for your time. You know, thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you very much. And I have to say thank you again. Thank you very much for sending me the incredible care package. Thank you very much. It, that was very generous. Thank you. And again, thank you for the um, Ninja Kaiden review copies. Thank you very much. I wish you all the success at Ninja Kaiden and Manticore. Um, and, and I hope that when you go to New York Comic Con that that you're going to be that that you're going to be okay that you know you know that you know you know and stuff like that so yeah um, appreciate that yeah um, now if you are a new comic book reader or a lifelong comic book reader please check out Ninja Kaiden issue three will be out in shops on September 28th issue four will be out on October 26th. Now, if your shop does not carry this title, please ask them to order or and pre-order the series. I'm being honest, you know, this is a sleeper hit comic reader should pick up. The story is great, the art is great, it's very good. And also to Manticore, you know, I love this um, European style book. Uh, it's very good. I, you know, I emailed Eric saying, I love the pacing of the story. I love the artwork and the colors are fantastic. And I just love the cinnamon color of the, um, of the manticore. It's a nice contrast. It, it's, it's really nice. It very is. And, you know, again, you know, so please check out, you know, Ninja Kaiden and manticore. And also too, manticore is available on Eric's website, ericpalicki.com. Um, and if you are going to New York Comic Con, he will have Manticore, um, he will have the first two issues of Ninja Kaiden and um, Manticore as well. And please stop by his table. So please check out his table. Um, I wanna thank Drew, the co-host of Comics for Fun and Profit for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. and. Eric, I just got to say this. Thank you very much for being a fan of the show. Thank you for supporting our show. Thank you very much. Um, if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And I want to thank you, the listener. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>